Good morning, Liberty Orlando. It is good to be with you, even if it is at a distance, but thank the Lord for the technology that we now enjoy so we can do things as we're doing today. We all love to give thanks when things are going our way. It is easy to trust the Lord when everything is happening just as you're hoping it would happen. But what is more of a challenge or a greater demonstration of faith is having confidence in the Lord even when things aren't going exactly how you'd planned or being grateful to God even when your prayers aren't answered exactly how you wanted them answered. There are so many accounts in Scripture where it looks like the heroes of our faith were doomed but for God. And that's one thing we always have to recognize. Colossians 1 talks about that not only did the Lord Jesus create everything, but through His power, everything is sustained. So when we open our eyes in the morning and we see that natural law is still in effect and everything is still being held together, we can rest assured that Jesus is still on His throne. The pilgrims are one of the greatest demonstrations of faith that I can point out. You know, time and again, they were actually persecuted because they were trying to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, not by the dictates of the established state church. They were reading the Bible, the Lord was speaking to them, and they were trying to follow the Lord earnestly and sincerely. They found themselves being wanted men and women, being under arrest, uh, being betrayed on several occasions, losing all their possessions, actually jailed because of their Christianity. Eventually, after being in Holland for a number of years, they came to the conclusion that they needed to go to the New World. And even that was a perilous trip as they left Plymouth, England, trying to go in the summer and then had to turn around and go back to Plymouth, England and start all over again when one of their two ships developed a leak. By the time they set sail, it was too late to travel the North Atlantic. And when they arrived in Massachusetts, it was insane. It was in the dead of winter. And there were no hotels to welcome them. There was no warm place to stay. But... For God, the story should have never had the ending that we now know that it has. I love Thanksgiving. This is the most spiritual of holidays to me. Uh, it certainly has a biblical basis and, of course, included some of the greatest heroes of faith that I am aware of that aren't actually recorded in Hebrews 11. And I hope that you enjoy the message that we're presenting to you today. A dear friend of mine, Dr. Paul Jaley, pastors the New Testament Church in Plymouth. He's one of the foremost uh, historians on the pilgrims and the Puritans. He uh, leads the Plymouth Rock Foundation and uh, helps organize a, a, an annual uh, parade of some 250,000 people show up in Plymouth every year on a normal year to enjoy the celebration. Dr. Jaley, you perhaps saw in the documentary Monumental that was produced by Kirk Cameron back in 2012 as one of the subject matter experts. Well, we had Dr. Jaley recently in the state of Oklahoma, spoke a number of times across the state. We had him twice in our church, once for a pastor's luncheon, and then on this particular Sunday morning. As we approach Thanksgiving this week, I hope the words of this message encourage you as they've encouraged me. But God. I'm going to share some remarks with you today from the second psalm. So if you want to turn to Psalm 2, I want to share with you some things that um, I believe are from the throne room. I know they're from the throne room because I'm reading from the book that was written from the throne room. Um, as an introduction, before I start uh, just sharing in these verses, I want you to know several things. There were four dominant things that faced the pilgrims 400 years ago. A small congregation that was never wealthy, never numerous, a congregation that was a remnant, and they faced these things and they overcame them because of their view of what God had said. We have a choice. I've shared with my wife while I've been out here, it's been a blessing. I said to her, man, I'm a fiend, man. I've got underground news sources, email sources. Uh, I've got everything. I've been listening to everything. I've no, I want to know what's going on way over this side, that side, upside, downside. I haven't seen a news broadcast on television since I've been here. It's been a good thing. My wife said, you better thank God you have not watching what I'm watching. <laughs> but I'll tell you that um, 
The pilgrims had an overriding fear of death. They had a very legitimate fear of death. Their friends had been put in the Tower of London. When I went to the Tower of London, did a tour over in London of the Christian sites over there, I was able to go inside the Tower of London and look at the actual implements of persecution and torture. They were given to those people who did not follow what the authorities wanted them to follow. They had a legitimate fear that they would die. They had a legitimate fear of persecution. The whole tendency of society had gone against everything that they had just been converted to believe. They were filled with disappointments and discouragements. It followed them everywhere they went. Every plan that they made ended up going wrong. You'd think, hey, listen, God, God, if we've come to follow you, if we're a remnant here, if we are settling our hearts, we say we're committed to the word of God, we're committed to the lordship of Christ, we're going to form a covenant that hasn't been formed for a while, we're going to separate from the church of England, we're going to honor you, we're going to do what you said to do, then why does every place we turn, turn against us? How come everything goes wrong? If they had to be discouraged, they'd be legitimate. You would not say to them, you shouldn't be discouraged. You'd be discouraged too. Everything goes. The very families in your neighborhood you thought would stand with you turned against you. You see, there was a law in England in 1585 that simply said this. If you, don't see, if you see a family not worshiping in the state church, then you as a neighbor have got to turn them in. If we find out you knew that they did not worship in the state church, you get the same punishment they do. They turned every neighbor against those that were doing what was right. And they began to be turned in. They had to have secret services. They would arrive at all different time periods. Americans usually arrive to church at different time periods anyway. I'm a pastor. I understand that, all right? But the point is it doesn't have to do with where you are in the country. I've been all over the country. That does not the issue. But the point is, they had to do it strategically so they wouldn't be caught. The neighbors wouldn't see them. The youth groups had a ministry of spying. The teenagers would be out talking to neighbors just to find out who knew they had a secret church meeting there. This became discouraging, though, because everything would go wrong. They had, their, their numbers would be depleted. But they didn't just face the discouragement that every time they do something forward, there would be issues that come to them that would cause them to go backward. Well, God, if you're... If you're the one prospering us, if you're the one that's honoring those who honor you, then why, God, all of this discouragement? Because you know the promises of God have a certain thing in between them called time. And God does not promise it's going to happen even in our lifetimes. God doesn't promise that. They had to overcome that. They overcame that fear of death recognizing this. And now I'll put it in my words. The worst thing that God can allow the devil to do is change our address. Earth to heaven. So you may as well fall, fall forward. They knew it. When you face discouragement and you face disappointment, they rehearsed to them what they ended up writing as to why they came. They came to propagate and advance the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in those remote parts of the world. Yea, though they would be stepping stones unto others for the performing of so great a work. So if I don't see it in my lifetime, if you don't see it in your lifetime, we're stepping stones. We stand for our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren because we serve the advance of the kingdom, not just the society of the church. We're people of the book. We see the end. We know we win. We know he's already won. They would rehearse themselves. So if you're discouraged, you're disappointing. William Bradford called it this. Soon all their troubles were like flea bitings, he said. Flea bitings? Yeah, just do that. But they faced delay, incredible delays. They were delayed a whole year in trying to escape to Holland. They got delayed three months just in coming to the New World. I mean, whoever plans to arrive in New England in November <laughs> and build houses in December and January where the earth is so hard you can't even put a hole for the post. They didn't plan to do that. That's the, bo that's the bottom line. They planned to leave in July. But everything went wrong. Their investors changed the financial contract at the last minute knowing they'd already sold their houses, sold their lands. They'd already pulled their, their, their money. 
There was nothing else they could do. And they get on the Speedwell in Holland and go to join the Mayflower in Southampton. And when they get to Southampton, they're handed the new financial contract. Well, how do you change that? They're furious at their own agents that changed it without letting them know. Now, granted, it would have taken a long time to let them know. There's no email. There's no phone call. But now what do you do? They trusted the will of God. That God, if you have us, they even said, this financial contract is more for people in captivity than free people who honor God. And it changed their whole style to one of a commonwealth where they put everything in common. So, you know, the, the investors, the, the most famous sermons in economics at the time of the pilgrims was to preach against profit. Profit is a sin. You're not supposed to make any profit except the businessmen who are sending the people. <laughs> you know, whenever you disobey God's word uh, and people say they don't believe it, it's always selective. When it benefits me, I'll, I'll take it. I'll borrow it. That's the way the businessmen were. So they knew it, but they said we had to trust ourselves to the will of God and still proceed. And still go. Then the Speedwell leaks, the only boat they own. And they lose all that financial profit, all their supplies. They take 20 extra people onto the Mayflower. 20 go behind, rather. They take 11 more people on the Mayflower. Now they're squeezed. It's a merchant ship. It's a wine ship. You're not supposed to go on vacation on a Mayflower. You don't go there for that. You're going to roll back and forth 30 degrees on a sea, and the boat is to roll the water off, not keep the water off. So you're always drinking salt water. You're in a small bunk bed for one, but there's two to a bed. They start getting sick. Guess what? You do too. Sickness. Seasickness. Loss of all their financial profit, all their supplies. Now they're low on supplies. They're going to land in winter, and they have only one boat, and that's the one they rented. Now they have no boat to fish. Now they have no way to send back to repay their debts. I mean, I could go on and on. But folks, this story doesn't look good. This story looks like a complete and absolute failure. We should never even have heard of the pilgrims. The, the whole thing was doomed before it started. But God. The whole thing was going to be a failure, but God. Everything seemed to go wrong, but God. It seemed that the enemy was winning, but God. And now, let's look at Psalm 2, because we're going to hear from God. That's not me. That's his word. Why do the, he the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Folks, this is God's answer. You see, Psalm are often, they're either us pouring our hearts to God, and so it's pretty graphic. God, I'm in trouble. Doesn't look like you're around. How come the wicked prosper? Why does it seem like those who honor you don't get a fair shake? What's going on here, God? You're going to hear that from the psalmist because you need to know when you read the psalms, when is it the heart pouring out to God? or God speaking back. And the question comes, God, why do the nations rage? Why does it appear that the nations of the earth are always at war with you? Why does it seem to be even the kings, the rulers, the civil rulers of the nations of the world? Why do they seem to be plotting a vain thing? The kings setting themselves up and the nations taking counsel together. Now, the Hebrew words there are very significant. Why does it say that the kings of the earth seem to plot? They actually plan to rule the world. Why do they take counsel? To conspire. Why are there conspiracies that are hidden? If the average American person knew what was really going on, if the curtain was pulled back, and you knew what was really running the show, the average American would vomit. Yeah. Amen. Right. And God has a time. Listen, the Wizard of Oz is going to be exposed. <laughs> but here's the point. There's no, it's only a matter of time 
But the thing that we have to recognize is this. Due to the fallen world, due to the fact that we live in a fallen world, due to the fact that all through recorded history from the Bible and in history that followed the Scriptures when it was canonized at 400 A.D., all the history we know, more than 95% of every nation that has ever existed has adopted a tyrannical monarchy. Less than 5% have ever tasted liberty in the history of the world. Why? Because the kings completely always bent. Once they get authority, they want all authority. Therefore, they plot against God. Make no mistake about it. The ultimate war is not against us. It's against God. And the ultimate one responsible to put it down, expose it, and rule over it is God and not us. And I'm thankful for that too. But this thing is a normal occurrence. Now for us, we live in a nation that has been one of the exceptional nations where the kingdom of God manifested through people fully surrendered to Him. Not never perfect. And the manifestation of the kingdom brought liberty to a nation rather than tyranny. Because the manifestation of the kingdom is very different. What other kingdom is there in all the world where the king lives in his subjects? That's an upside-down kingdom. When people think of the kingdom, they always think of pagan kingdoms. Some king sitting on a throne writing an edict, and uh, unless you know someone that knows the king, you're in trouble. Kings don't have to follow rules. They are the rules. Well, in the kingdom of God, that's different. Christianity is different. The king of kings came to the earth and came and lived under the law to be able to redeem you that you and I might know the king. And he lives inside of us by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the kingdom of God moves from the bottom up, from the inside out. The internal is causative to the external. The invisible is causative to the visible. So what you see on the outside is not the end of the story. It is not the most powerful thing that you see. Always remember, what you see on television, what you read about, what you see in the civil realm is only a dim reflection of what's really going on. So don't come to all those conclusions. Be like a pilgrim. Look at the discouragement in the face. Look at the fears that are coming across people and saying, oh my gosh, what is ahead for the next few months? We don't really know, but I'll tell you this. All the predictions have to have one small clause. Yes, we have to look at the reality, but God. In fact, it says here, what, where do these leaders actually do? They go against the Lord and against his anointed. Yes, against God, but now, you know, the anointed of God. Now, I know I'm in circles all the time, and I preach to lots of different people, and I'm in circles where the church has often adopted the monarchical, top-down elitism of the world. And that's a problem, because we're supposed to be influencing the world, not the world influencing us. But it says very clearly here, the Lord's anointed uh, at times addresses Christian leaders in the Bible. Old and New Testament. But this is actually the people of God. Listen, folks. The enemy first wants to take out God. Can't do it. Tried once. The score is 1-0. No overtime. (laughs) He lost. And we recognize that. But now he goes after God's people. I want you to listen, what, listen carefully. This is what he goes after. He says the following, We will break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Now, listen carefully. The strategy of the enemy has never changed. He's not creative. He uses the same strategy. There's just a different label on the bottle of poison, but the poison is always the same. He wants to divide the church. If he can get the church fighting each other because we think the ultimate thing in Christianity is coming to church. We think the ultimate thing is having a good church. That's a great thing. A lot of people don't have that. They go and get their ears tickled. They go and get what they exactly want to hear. Someone said to me, he said, Paul, how come your church grows and then thins? Say, well, you know what? We have blessed many area churches around our church. Not always intentionally. (laughs) But you see, 
if you want the truth, if you desire the truth, that's a good thing. But folks, let me tell you, the enemy wants us divided. He wants us to look down at other churches, true churches I'm talking about, who love Jesus. And not to look down at anybody, but the enemy wants to do that. His goal has always been, if I can divide the body of Christ. Folks, the body of Christ that just voted in the election was a divided body. We're not, we're not working together. It's going to take a death to self to work together. It's going to take a taking up of the cross. And it's going to take the recognition. We understand what the enemy's devices are. It has nothing to do with just American culture or anything we're facing here in America. It's all throughout the world. It's what he does. But I want to focus on the second one. Folks, there's a second cord the enemy wants to break. Now listen. The context of the scripture is clear. He says this. And we want to separate and divide the cord they have with us. In other words, God has created a responsibility for believers to join with other believers, join in the Word of God, and learn how to walk in unity, and you not have to agree on every single thing. But you keep the main thing as the main thing. And you're able to take, take the things that aren't the main thing and put them aside. And say, we will work with you. We will do what we can. We're not going to violate the Scriptures. We're not, we're, I'm not into multi-ethnic and multi-religious services where we, we, we uh, defy the creeds of God. No. But I am willing in the culture to stand with those who stand for truth. And I know the difference. And the critical thing is the enemy wants to cut the cord that we have. God is designed by His design for His people to have a cord of influence with the culture. First, we're united with God. That's the strongest. Then we're united with each other. That's the cross. Vertical covenant, horizontal covenant. And then we give ourselves to the culture that we might light the culture around us. Because every nation is a reflection of the most dominant influence of the church. Good or bad. You know the scripture, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, but we also leave out the second part. The second Hebrew parallelism, the people he has chosen for his own inheritance. Meaning, in Hebrew parallelism, the second explains the first. How does God bless the nation? By the condition of his people. Then how does he curse a nation? By the condition of his people. Or we might say, the lack of condition of his people. How, how does that happen? Folks, we get... The culture that we resemble. Not the one we deserve. Because I, I preach this all the time. I preached years ago and got in real trouble. It was one of my first big trouble. Big conference. Thousands of people. Someone later told me, you were too inexperienced. You should not have said what you said. Me, don't say that to me. Because <laughs> I've said it again. I was at a massive conference. Way back many decades ago. And I said, if all of us in this conference, this Christian conference, became the Congress of the United States, instantly the nation would lurch further to the left. Now you understand, man. It got real quiet, okay? <laughs> and I'm the guy supposed to teach on cultural involvement. I remember some of the leaders in the front whispering to each other, I bet I know what they say. Who invited him? <laughs> but the truth is biblical. The truth is there. We have, Washington, D.C. is a merciful reflection of the people of God. And you say, yes, but it's filled with corruption. It's a merciful reflection of the people of God. You don't understand. They're evil. It's a merciful reflection of the people of God. Keep talking, and we're going to get close to our problem. Os Guinness put it this way. He said, we've got major problems in the body of Christ. But he, he said also, the culture is simply a reflection in spades of the church of God. Our, our corruption may be different, but one leads to the other. Now, I'm not saying you're willing those things to happen or you're, you're involved in the strategic decisions. I didn't say that. But I'll tell you this. The enemy always wants to cut the cord. For years we've had the situation where the people of God never wanted to touch their culture. 
In other words, they were convinced there was no cord. There was no covenantal responsibility to the culture around us. That we were supposed to be like Jesus taught against. I have not taken them out of the world. But I have tell them to overcome the evil by keeping them in the world. We, we retranslated it. Like we've retranslated Romans 12 too. We're transformed by the removal of our minds. <laughs> Rather than the renewal of our minds. Christians have shunned intellectual thinking and reasoning and logic when they don't understand the word logic comes from the Greek word logos, meaning God. God is the most logical God, but you better have His premise if you're going to understand it. Or we don't understand those things. So there is this. Now, you, we're in another extreme in the body of Christ because we've first, I don't want to have anything to do with the culture, but that's what the enemy wants. Separate that cord. But then secondarily, we realize this. Yeah, we recognize, gee, um, now Christians are equating politics with the kingdom. Folks, well, the two are different. They're so disappointed. Well, I thought the kingdom was coming. I thought we've had, look, we have this experience in Massachusetts all the time. We realize that's not the case. But folks, I want to just remind you, the two are not synonymous. Politics is like exhaust. If you run your car in your garage and you just worship politics, you'll die. Yeah. Right. So we're not into an election politics result. We want the kingdom to come. And we want to say to God, God, we embrace that cord that you have. Whatever you need to do to mature your church in this nation, that it will no longer be spineless, no longer be unwilling to take its responsibility, then Lord, you do what is necessary to wake up your people. Amen. This is, we are entering into a season in the body of Christ in America where God's going to send us to the gym. He's going to show us weights that are difficult to lift. He's going to show us what we should have been doing. You'd never exercise the prayer life. Never exercise fasting. You never exercise those area. Well, folks, how did it work out for you? Get back to the gym. Walk with God and don't build an idol of politics or civil government. It has a very specific ministry in the earth and we don't want it to have a greater one. Then don't treat it like a greater one. But the Bible goes on. The Bible goes on to say this. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. In other words, what's God's response to the kings of the earth trying to dethrone him? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but look what we have planned. We have this cabal over here. We've got this plan over here. We're financing this over there. We've got them on every side. We've got this corruption, that corruption. And now... <laughs> We're licking our chops. We have the whole enchilada all taken care of. Ha, ha, ha. That is so funny. It would be good to go to the scriptures and when you see it and you get terrorized by evil, laugh a little. It's a holy laughter. God is saying, you know, it's kind of like, are you kidding me? You puny, you We've kept this hidden from all the people. I see it clearly. You know, it's like the five-year-old standing in your living room. I'm hiding. You can't see me, Mommy. You can't see me. I'm hidden. And you're like, that is so cute. <laughs> well, that's just like it is. All the evil of the world. Is it? We're hiding. We got, it. we got it concealed. God's like, that is really. Now keep that up, and I'm going to be laughing for a while. Not only that, the Lord holds them in derision. He will speak to them in his wrath and has distressed them in the deep displeasure. Yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Folks, you have to realize that God's saying, are you kidding me? You are not taking the seat of my son. You will not take the throne of the kingdom. You will not win. I hold you in derision. And therefore, there has been a decree, folks, from the beginning of time, pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, the Father and the Holy Spirit had a council. They've had several in the Bible. It's very clear. Let us make man. That was a council. It took council to make us. It, it was an elders meeting. <laughs> I remember one time a man came to a theologian uh, and said, look, I don't want to go to heaven. The theologian said, why don't you want to go to heaven? I read Revelation. There's 24 elders there. 
I got enough problem with the five in my church. <laughs> but the point is, you're looking and you're saying, listen, the Bible says there will be no such thing. Look at verse 7 real quickly. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to, uh, to me, you are my son. Today I have forgotten you. And ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession, and you shall break them with a rod of iron. So folks, long before any of us were around, pre-incarnate Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, you have Christ and the Father, and they're having a discussion. And the father turns to the son. This is eternity past. So don't try to date this on a timeline. Eternity past. Today I have begotten you. That means eternally today I have begotten you. That does not mean he had a beginning or an end. No, he has an eternal begotten position. Which means he is a son but co-equal with the father. Just a different function in the Trinity. Do you know the Trinity is the triune manifestation of God that tells us you can have different functions and still get along? Do you know other religions don't have trinities? Other religions can be put in two. I teach world religions to students, and uh, I'll speak on it. You have on one side all the plurality. In other words, we're many but not one. And that's all the pantheistic religions, and you have a 350 million gods. Then on the other side, you have those that are just one. There's just one god, monism, and all the others where there's, there's only one, but there's no diversity. So people who are different don't get it. They don't make it there. And if you're different over here, you so get it, you can't find God because there's 350 million of them. <laughs> but God, it says this, I model for you the model forever. You can get along with different functions because that's what God does. God models whatever he wants us to do. And here's this discussion. And the father says to the son, sit on my right hand. I will give you the inheritance of the nations and the ends of the earth for your possession. It's a decree. It is done. The son said, yes, Whatever I need to do to gain the inheritance, I will do. He came. He did it. Folks, in the body of Christ, we need to keep looking back to the cross. It's on the cross He dethroned principalities and powers. It's on the cross He set captivity captive. It's at the cross when He won every battle. The body of Christ has been tricked into deception. What we do is we simply re reference the first coming and our whole focus is on the second. I think our focus should be on the first and the second should be a reference because we don't know when he's coming and all we've done is quibble over when and how. Jesus said don't. Just don't be in a generation where there's no faith on the earth but occupy till I come. That's the root of occupation. There is no such thing as full-time Christian service over here and then I'm a plumber. I had told Richie that, uh, no, that former occupation was not one of God. <laughs> but I know that God is doing that. Folks, the decree has been made. Look, if you can rest in something assured of this, regardless of the plans of the spiritual enemy or those who might have enemies of evil, enemies of liberty, and want slavery of any kind, Folks, we can rest in this decree. The decree has been made in heaven. It will be carried out on earth in his time. And therefore, we can rest in our spirits. The decree has been made. The Son is the King of kings. And it's not changing. Amen. Whatever happens on earth will not change it. In fact, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. This is, not, this is not God. You're just saying, well, gee, God, that sounds like a, God's a God of war. Yeah? I'll never forget it. My wife and I were invited to go to an uh, honorable banquet for wounded warriors. It was in Massachusetts, and I had gotten to know several of the veterans. We're, we honor veterans all the time in our church, and so we, we, I got invited to pray before these veterans. Now, I walked in, and I walked around before the meeting. I went table to table with my wife, and these are veterans. They have no right arm. They have no, maybe no left arm, no feet, no, no legs. They're, they are in wheelchairs. They can barely move. They are tilted on the side, and I just began to speak with them. They said, oh, oh yeah, what are, you, what are you, a chaplain? I said, no, I'm, I'm a pastor. I just want to come here to bless you. But I tell you, I wasn't prepared for what was happening. Now, I had already warned 
the person that I said, look, when I pray in front of veterans, I pray a certain way. I don't want to offend you, but at the same time, if you're very offended, you can have someone else pray. I'll just sit here. In other words, the prayer is non-negotiable. <laughs> you can tell me no, and that's totally fine. And she just said, oh, I, I, that's the very unusual prayer, I, but you go ahead. And what I did is I addressed the Lord of hosts, Amen. the Lord of war, that when a war is just before him, then he executes wrath. When I finished that prayer, the only time it's ever happened in my life, a standing ovation occurred. These veterans pulling themselves up out of their seats with their hands. I was weeping in the front. My wife couldn't even compose herself in the front row because they knew what it was like. But we serve a God of war as well as a God of peace. And he knows when to do both. And you and I have to recognize if it's a spiritual war, he wins. If it's the last resort on earth, he still wins. But either way, we recognize it's the Lord of hosts. I'll never forget that moment. I, I go back to my wife. I, I say, watching those veterans stand. Listen, let me tell you, just watching them try to stand. I went then table to table. They grabbed my hands. They said to me, Pastor, it's about time somebody prayed like that. Amen. I recognize that it says now in verse 10, now therefore be wise. So what do you do with this kind of message? What do you do? Just rehearse? God has everything under control. And you turn on the television. It doesn't look like it. Okay, well, then what do we do? Okay, I'm just schizophrenic. I read the Bible and then I read the newspaper. No. I know it dates me. There are no more newspapers. I understand all that. <laughs> but I tell you, no. We assure ourselves of this. Whatever it appears to be on earth, it does not shake the truth of what is in heaven. And God is into manifesting heaven on earth. That's how we pray, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's a measure of heaven coming to earth before we go to heaven. I simply want to be part of a generation that sees a measure of the manifestation of the kingdom his way through peace, through service, through a loving other people that don't even like you, through serving your community, serving your culture. Always remember, we must salt a culture at least five times more than we attempt to light it. We knew in our own church that would have to be the case. We have, salting means we serve the community in unconditional love, regardless of whether they receive it. Our church doesn't have to be in lights, and they don't have to praise us. We're doing it for the honor of God and His glory. We see where the needs are. We regularly go to our public officials and ask their top three needs. I want to know from the fire chief, the police chief, the mayor, uh, the, uh, the district attorney, the sheriff. I want to know what are the top three needs. I build relationships with them. I don't care what stripe they are politically. They're in office and I honor that. And I go and I do that. And they recognize it. I've invited them to prayer meetings. I've had, the, I've had superintendent of schools and other come to our intercessor meeting and tell us what are the three things we should pray for. Why pray when, with no knowledge of what the real need is. And so we've done that and we've recognized, listen, God, you can help us to pray and to serve and to salt the community. Not assault the community. Salt the community. And there'll be a time when light must be shown and of course that exposes darkness. But the scriptures go on and says, therefore be wise, O king. So God first speaks to the kings. Then he's going to speak to the people because that's the address of this. He speaks to the kings, be wise. I would say, if I had the audience, to those who are actually uh, creating and strategizing for evil, wherever they are, in any party, yeah. I'm not a party person. I want to be a statesman. I stand for truth. Yeah. Doesn't matter to me. I'm not, I'm, I'm not even a, par a member of either party. But I'll tell you this. I recognize the following, that I recognize that if I have the chance, I always say to public officials, they say, well, what do you think I should do? It's the first thing I think you should do is be very wise and honor the God of heaven. Because things don't happen very nicely over time to those who disregard him. Yeah. So you might say, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. There are civil officials who are going to do things without any reference to God. They're not wise. That is foolish. God says, be wise, O kings of the earth. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. 
All of our rejoicing in God, all of our goals and desires should be done with trembling. Yes, there's joy. That's great to laugh. I laugh more when I travel with Richie than I laugh with anybody else. And it's the same jokes over and over. Okay, anyway. But I still laugh. Because even if they aren't funny, he laughs. My wife tells me sometimes, you're looking really glum. What's your problem? I'll tell her this issue in the church. Uh, I, I don't know why I keep counseling people and they don't do what you say anyway. And, and the point is, I, what is, and she tells me this. She goes, oh, you know what? You need a day with Richie. Go get your costume on. Be somebody else and travel with him for a day. All right? And I do. And I come back laughing. And my wife said, good. Thank you, Richie. But the point is, you and I recognize that serve the Lord with fear. It means that as we do it, there is a certain element with all of us. We need to ask God, God, do I fear you more than anything? I don't want to do anything that is ashamed to you. God, I want to serve you. And if it means I, I, just, I just submit, I go, I go and do what you tell me to do, then that's fine. But the critical thing is we do it with fear. And then he addresses and he said to the kings and to the people, kiss the son lest he be angry with you and you perish in the way. When this wrath is kindled but a little, and then he, he speaks and concludes to the people, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So the bottom line is this, folks. The kings of the earth had better wise up that there is a God. They may not think there's a God. They might think that everything is going to go exactly according to their plan. But I can tell you throughout history, that has not happened. The pharaohs of Egypt thought that. The pharaohs of where Israel dwelt thought that. I don't have to follow this God. I don't have, but they learned a different story. They came up to Moses and their backs are to the Red Sea. The Red Sea opens. They say, what a stupid God. He opens the water so we can get those slaves back until the waters came and covered them. Tyrants have had to learn the hard way all throughout history. Nebuchadnezzar did it. He was the king of the whole earth. He had thought he had gotten the whole earth under his power. But God... And then he spent seven years learning to worship God. And the earth, when his fingernails grew, he looked like an eagle, never shaved. He didn't look like someone you'd want to come back to the kingdom. And when he came back, he was a humbled man. Why? But God. Think of Alexander the Great. He thinks he has the entire earth. He's only 33 years of age. He sits on a hill and looks over it, very upset. He can't think of another person to kill. So he thinks, you know what? Maybe there's some way I can still rule the world. Has a heart attack and dies right there on the hill, 33 years of age. I mean, come on. Look at, look at Rome. Look at the Caesar. Look at Agrippa. Look at Felix in the book of Acts. I don't give God glory. I mean, but God, we don't know what he's going to do. We don't pray for it to be done. We know that God is going to be on the throne. We, we know it. Listen, folks, in the French Revolution, the ultimate goal of the French Revolution was the rule of the world. Maybe you know that, maybe you don't. The guy, you know, French Revolution, we're going to have equality, fraternity. That's all without God. You're not going to get that without God. And what do they get? They want pure democracy. That ends in tyranny. What do they get as a result of the French Revolution? Napoleon. Man, he's so stuck on himself, when he goes to get coronated by the Pope, he grabs the throne, the, the crown out of the Pope's hand, puts it on his own head, and lays hands on himself. Now, you probably haven't read that in your history book, but he is so intoxicated with his own pride, he says, I don't need anybody to pray for me, and nobody's going to inaugurate me. I inaugurate myself. Not only that, i got a plan, Napoleon said. I'm going to take over the entire world. I'm going to deal with it all the time. Now, i got one big nuisance, which is that new nation that just got formed over the United States. But I'm going to take it error. They had all the plans made. All the blueprints were written up. All they were going to trick every nation. And they get a secret writer nobody knows about. And they put it in his satchel. All the documents. Look, I spent seven years studying conspiracies. So this is just one little drawer. But you know what I learned? I was really depressed. My wife was very upset with me for seven years. And I vowed never to do that again. It's not the thing I would recommend to anybody. I mean, I got every conspiracy book there is. And the point is this. He's riding at midnight to deliver a satchel of the most precious papers that outline in exposure, in the light, all the plans to take over the world. And he's riding through a forest 
and a lightning bolt comes out of the sky, kills him on horseback, and he falls down, and the papers get sprawled on the front lawn of the leading patriot that wanted to resist that whole movement. Now, you can't make that up. All you can say is, you almost have the world. You're almost going. But God's. It doesn't work that way. We don't know how far God will let whatever machination of evil to go. But there's one thing we can be certain. God, whatever you want us to go through, it's for our good. Whatever you want us to go through, Lord, is for our maturation. You want to give us some bigger weights that we haven't lifted before in Christianity. I need to have a character that's more loving even in the face of evil and those areas. I'm not going to react with vengeance. God, put me under control. Help me embrace the cross of Jesus Christ. Take up my cross. Deny myself and follow you. You are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. That's how the pilgrims thought about it. If you want us to die along the way that our great grandchildren experience the kingdom, then so be it, God. But there's one thing we'll do. We will not bow our knee to the enemy. We will bow it only to the King of Kings. And we will do it in a refined manner that you strengthen us to lift the weights of prayer, to lift the weights of Bible study, to lift the weights of character, to lift the weights that we haven't lifted before. And when we leave the gymnasium, we'll say, God, I'm in a better position now than I was before. But one thing I know, you are king, you rule it all, you're not getting off the throne, and you are going to build your kingdom, and the nations will be your inheritance. God bless you. Go ahead and remain standing, and we are going to usher right into our time of, of, uh, of um, thank you, imitation. Sometimes the words just leave you. <laughs> you know, Christianity, as I say virtually every time I speak, and said it yesterday, Christianity is not based upon a feeling. It's not based upon an emotion. It's based upon a fact. Amen. Jesus said when asked for evidence as if he hadn't already provided enough. He said, there's only going to be one bit of evidence, evidence that I give to this uh, unregenerate world. It's this, three days after I go in the tomb, I'm coming out. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, if the tomb is empty, then Jesus is the Lord. Yeah. Now, if the tomb wasn't empty, then you've got nothing to worry about. Just go on about your day. But if everything Brother Paul just referenced from Psalm 2 is truth, and the tomb really was history. By the way, something happened 2,000 years ago where the entire history of the world is designated from the time of Jesus' birth. And it wasn't his crucifixion because there were thousands of Jewish men crucified by the Romans. But something was so significant that it transformed world history. That was the resurrection. If the tomb is empty, then Jesus is the Lord. That's up to each and every one of us is to decide what we're going to do with that bit of information. Mm -hmm. We can either, as Agrippa said, almost, Paul, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian, but no. Or we can, like Thomas, fall on our knees and cry out, my Lord, my God. Amen. Those are the only two options. Jesus likens it himself to the bridegroom and the bride. 2,000 years ago, he said, I do, for each and every one of us, as he hung naked on Calvary's cross. It's up to each and every one of us to say, I do to him. If we're going to see him in heaven and live with him eternally. We're going to have a time of invitation now after we pray. Our musicians will, will perform. We'll sing as Dan leads us. We'll sing one, maybe two stanzas at most. We've got ushers or counselors at both sides of the auditorium. And the invitation is actually fourfold. Number one, if you don't know that if you died today, you'd be in heaven you don't know that, but I invite you to come. We'll spend some time with you in the Scripture, and you can leave here today knowing that not only are you God's creation, but you are a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. We should know that we have eternal life, not hope that we have it. Second, if you just want to come and pray, Jesus said, my house is a house of prayer. We have areas up here. Please come, pray. You can pray with a family member, pray by yourself, pray with one of our counselors. If there's something in your life that your brother Paul, I've been living a life that hasn't honored the Lord. I've been hypocritical in these things. I want to publicly rededicate my life today. You are invited to come. If you want to come and become a part of our fellowship, 
forth and finally. She said, I love what you guys do. You stand boldly. You proclaim the gospel. You stand against sin and corruption. I want to be a part of an active church. We invite you to come as well. Our invitation after I pray, please join me together. Father, we thank you so much for Brother Paul. Thank you for the timing of all this. Thank you for him being here this week at this time. Thank you for all that are here today. Thank you for those that are joining us online and via the radio and other means. Father, I pray that you would speak to every heart through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would draw us close to you. And Lord, I pray that we would not resist. Lord, I pray that there would not be a single person that leaves today not born again and walking in accordance with your will. Lord, to you be all the glory. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.